morning. It's Terry Yeadham here. I'm the author of The End of Fossil Fuel Insanity, a Canadian energy guy. Book is available at Amazon.com. Of course, you can check out his blog as well. He's one of the bloggers that actually became successful in the blog. Well, by successful, it's still around. Public energy number one. <laughs> Hey, isn't that how we deem success in the blogging world? If you're still around, you're successful? If you survive. There's something like 6,000 every day that gets started. So, yeah, I guess if you're around for a few years, you're success. I remember back about 10 years ago, and, of course, I compare the podcast revolution to the blogging revolution, but I think they said, like, after the 6th or 10th post on a blog, it was like a 95% abandonment rate where... <laughs> That was the yeah. end of it. People realized, oh, it's a lot of work. Of course, writers thought, oh, you're just going to go do my full-time job in your spare time. Okay, good for you. <laughs> yeah. Yep, it's not easy. So let's get to the uh, uh, energy topic at hand here. I got kind of a couple for you. First off, uh, I want you to set the stage a little bit for those people who maybe don't understand your perception when it comes to energy. You're a Canadian. So you're up north. Mm -hmm. You are. You're in yep. Alberta. Is that right, Alberta? I'm correct. In Cal that's correct. In, in, I'm in Calgary. Yeah. Okay. So you're Cal. Oh, Flames. There you go. Calgary Flames. Are they still a hockey team? Yep. They. Uh, well, it's sort of. You, if, you, if you call that hockey, no, they're actually pretty good. They have their ups and downs. Okay. So they didn't they're move they, like Winnipeg did and relocate. No, and that's correct. No, Quebec still here. and all yep. that. Okay. Good. So okay. It's. Been a yeah. while. I, I have a child who's 14, so, you know, I stopped paying attention to sports about 14 years ago. Um, it, we call it the toy department. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, just, you know, the, the energy is a little bit different in Canada than it is in America. Of course, America's more known for the private enterprise side of things, whereas in Canada, it's more known for the socialized, uh, uh, I guess, uh, side of things. So talk to me a little bit and set the table. Uh, what type of government and how energy is related, if you wouldn't mind? Sure. In, well, you, you, yeah, that, that's a good way to introduce it. Um, Canada has been, well, the, the, Canada has always been kind of broken in parts. Most of the population lives out east, which would be the equivalent of, of your um, New York and California dominance of the certain inspectors of the media and, and and the power center of canada has been in ontario and quebec uh that's where the biggest population is they're the oldest part of it the west was settled uh like like the u.s in the in not that long ago historically speaking and it's just been a resource extractor by and large with some tourism on the coast and um, but the center of it has just been resources and uh so that that's how it's developed it's sort of in isolation sort of quite regional and as, as time has gone on here, that's just been uh, accentuated uh, as people get more urbanized in, in Ontario and Quebec, and, and same as in the United States, then the, the hinterlands just become the resource extractors and people kind of lose touch with that a bit. And then in Canada here, like you said, it's more socialistic and we jumped on the, um, the climate change bandwagon earlier here. And so the pressure has been building on Canada for more than a decade for sure probably coming on close to 20 years i suppose pressure has been slowly building on the the oil and gas sector that hasn't happened in the united states the, and the the biggest impact for the canadian oil and gas sector is um, an inability to build any pipelines to get product out so we've had a lot of growth in the oil sands not lately but over the past uh, decade the early you know, 2000 and or 2000 to 2010 were very strong growth in the oil sands and we were able to build some pipe at that time, and that's since changed. And on the natural gas side, we can't build any pipe either. So, so Canada has all of this uh, enormous oil and gas resource base that you can't find a market except to existing uh, lines to the United States. The biggest difference with the United States from energy, the energy perspective is the, the United States underwent this massive shale boom and was able to build out the infrastructure to make all that happen. The Marcellus was able to connect, went from zero BCF nearly to 30 BCF a day and was able to build pipe to connect that to markets. The Permian took off and built uh, pipe and infrastructure to get that to markets. Offshore terminals were built for 
for natural gas and uh, the United States became an exporter of, of those products in a huge way. Uh, so that, that, that the free market side of the U.S. has allowed all that to happen, whereas Canada has been stagnant for a long time. So, so the very long story, sorry, but um, the, the long and the short of it is now we've been kind of in this box for coming on years now, since basically since the oil price crash of 2014, we've been struggling here. And the political pressure just mounted, gets stronger all the time. So I, th- I think in some ways the United States is catching up to us in that regard, in the pressure that's being applied to the industry. So, And it's not all bad. I don't mean to make it sound like that. There's tightening of emissions. There's less flaring. There's more attention paid to spills, that sort of thing. There's um, definitely environmental benefits to it. But the the other side of it is just the um, ridiculous pressure that's being put on to try and wipe out the the industry and, and the our own federal government in large just a good chunk of the federal ruling class politicians that really really don't like the oil and gas sector so uh, you see that on the democrat side in the u.s with bernie and elizabeth um and if they get to the power then you might get a taste of what we get <laughs> well that's what i'm kind of wondering and where i'm going with the next question is i don't know how closely you're following the united states uh oil and gas market i assume you are because you generally do oh very closely uh yeah early march i want to say just right on the even before the first bailout came uh they talked about an oil and gas bailout and mike summers president of api was quick to come out in the media and say absolutely not and i kind of joked i said before the reporter even finished the question he just said nope and that really set the stage for kind of the old mentality of we don't take subsidies, we don't take bailouts, government stay out of things. Well, uh, Parsley Energy's Matt Gallagher goes on CNBC a couple weeks later and says, you know, maybe the Texas Railroad Commission should step in and control production. So you've got this ideological crossroad happening and where north dakota just met the other day had a public meeting on it oklahoma's had one so you got three states now three big states oklahoma north dakota and texas talking about government controlled production have you followed this and as a canadian uh, do you got any advice or and or opinions on this uh, it, it's a tough spot i i totally understand the free market guys um that I'm a free marketer myself, and, and ideally that's how things work best. That's the best allocator of capital. That's the best results you know, or in the long run. Um, the, a reality that's hard to, um, to, for people to accept sometimes is that the, it's not a free market. The oil market is anything but a free market. And the, the U.S. produces 12, bil- 12 million barrels a day out of a global total of 100 million barrels a day. And that out of that 100 million barrels, the majority comes from heavily manipulated um, uh, producing countries that, that that have government hands involved, and so that to so to stand alone and be a, a free market um, adherent in a market that isn't a free market, it, it's a, it's 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 a, it just makes the fight that much harder because you're tying your hands behind your back without having the government go to bat for you or against you, I suppose. And we've been we've been forced to deal with that in Canada with the apportionment issues because we can't get our our um, product out of the country. So so some government intervention is necessary even to make help infrastructure get built and that sort of thing. So when you come to this weird place like we have in short order here, if this hadn't if the coronavirus thing hadn't happened, this would have played out in slower time, and the U.S. would have adapted to an oversupplied market by. The, we've already seen the capital supply kind of dry up even to the um in the permian and some of the bigger areas that everyone's share prices are low the debt markets are harder uh, to access so um the, the, the supply of capital was shrinking and it would have it would have sorted itself out but this is really a crisis time no one's seen a demand collapse like this so to to um for, for the the free market to sort through it 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 can be done but is it necessarily the best way to do it but if you ask for intervention, then you, or is that opening a can of worms? Um, but I, I do think that there's some level of intervention that just happens globally, even if it's at the international level. There's there are things that that happen which are 
um, interferences in the free market. So it, it's it's a it's a very tough thing to do, and I don't I don't have a definitive answer. I think that apportionment, uh, which we've seen in Canada here, where everyone just gets cut back proportionally, can can work, and in some ways it's it's fair. But um, yeah, I, I, I understand the arguments against it, though, for sure. Well, that's that's why I kind of wanted to have you on because you're one that understands that right now, more than ever, the importance of public discussion is needed because mm-hmm. we're so used to the polarizing way it's been over the last 10 years that right now, I mean, this is a major shift. This is a major shift. And, and like I said, you know, the example I give, I think, is very appropriate to where when it first came out, this was before the CARES Act, they were talking about a bailout because to your point from earlier, the oil and gas industry was getting hit before the corona shutdown, before the COVID-19 shutdown. What? Absolutely. You, you and I were talking about this last year. And yep. they, they can go back in the interviews and check them out at thecrudelife.com. Go to our different social media pages, check it out. But you and I were having this discussion last year about the energy industry having a very difficult year but we thought it was because of a 16-year-old girl with Asperger's going around the country, going around the world, talking about how oil and gas is killing babies. And that's what she was doing. I Actually, I watched some of the speeches she was giving. Wow. I, I get it. I get it now. Oh, yeah. That's that's incredible. I mean, she's a terrific performer. And Yeah, it's pretty inflammatory stuff. It is. It is. It's It's aggressive. It is very aggressive, and the language is is something else. So, you know, be that as it may, um, that's where I wanted to go next with this. This is my concern. The environmental movement has gotten so big, and it has gotten so influential in government, that once that hand of government gets involved, like like you said before, where, where does where does it stop? And so I wanted to get your opinion on some something like this environmental wild card. Um, that is a uh-huh. very real thing uh, to where you actually in, in Canada have mentioned before that the queen owns the land. You guys just have the right to use it. And I thought I think that's just an amazing way to look at it. You know, like, oh, wow. So to me, if that happens in the U.S., I kind of see that perception changing more like the Canadian perception than the American perception. And I think the oil and gas industry is symbolic of that. Anyway, so your thoughts on uh, my really long question turned into an opinion. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I'll give you my two cents on that. And one thing I'm going to jump in and I'm going to correct you, and I'm going to ask you to to forevermore change your way of speech. <laughs> um, and I'm just joking, but uh, I think we need to stop talking about the environmental movement. Um, because I think that's creating a huge problem. Because we 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 hand the we hand the moral high ground to these people when we call them environmentalists. I know a lot of oil and gas people that are environmentalists. I know a lot of geologists that care more about the the, the care of the earth than anybody. And I think that there's an environmental movement and there's a climate change movement. And I, there's there's the the oil and gas sector can be environmentalists as, as much as anybody else. The fact that we provide the fuel for the world to survive doesn't preclude us from being environmentalists. The climate change movement is something totally different. That's a political beast. And I think they're using the environment as a means to a political end, more government control, more whatever else. So I think that's a slippery slope. But I think that the climate activist movement, they love this when we call them environmentalists because we we make them sound like the enemy and they go, oh, look at that. They don't like environmentalists. By definition, we're we're setting ourselves up for failure when we talk about them as the good guys, and 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 I think that's just um, I would love to just put a stake in the heart of that uh, that tactic um, because we can be environmentalists as much as they can. And when somebody everybody uses the fuel, right? Everybody uses gasoline. Everyone uses natural gas, whether they know it or not. It's in everything we have. And when we do a better job of producing that and a cleaner job of producing that, we're the environmentalists. They don't have any right to that high ground by trying to kill off the industry. So I, I think that I, that's where I would like to reframe this whole debate. And then, then it gets into the whole wider thing of the, the pressure that's being put on 
Um, and, and I think that the Greta's of the world who, who control the, the media channels, for sure, um, they, they get their power from, from that because they've gotten away with that for so long. That's why we love having you on. I've never, you know, we got to take a step back because I never thought of it like that. And that's a great way to really re-establish the narrative. Because you're right, it is a political movement. It there's mm-hmm. there's so much behind it, and you know, and the other thing that I I always think of with climate change is that that's another word for earth changes. There was an old uh, philosophy behind earth changes is that you know the mm-hmm. the wobbling of the earth and the movement of the sun and the moon and the stars and everything has a gradual change over the earth. They I think mm-hmm. used to cite Pangea as an example. I'm not, is Pangea not a thing anymore? Does people not understand that? Um, I haven't heard that in a long time. So well, there used to be that. a time when all the continents were together and they called it Pangea. Yeah. And then it br- drifted yeah. apart to where we are today. And and that that happened just through the dawn of time and, and through uh, the evolution of the planet. And so there's a there is a science called Earth Changes. And it's interesting how the climate change movement mimics that. It's almost like it took it over. And it's, yeah. it's disturbing to me because that was a really good hippie science for a long time. <laughs> and it was almost almost in the fringe, like uh, overnight coast-to-coast Art Bell aliens uh, follow-you-up type scientists. You know what I mean? For a long time. And yeah. not, now it's being ushered in by the politicians under a different name. So I just, yeah. I, I find it just yeah. comical. But uh, I, I wanted to get to well, your website. I, oh, go ahead. So ahead. Sorry. Well, I just say, I, I call it their Trojan horse movement where they, they utilize the environment to, to smuggle in a bunch of politicians behind the wall. I wrote about this in my book. Um, that People... I think it's mud, the waters are muddied and they like it that way. Like, but what are we most envir- What are we most worried about environmentally? Is it uh, the the loss of natural habitat? Is it pollution? Is it uh, spills? Is it just the overall footprint uh, of mining and extraction of, of everything? Minerals. And you can't just call oil and gas part of the problem because it's. Or I mean, the, you can't single it out so much because it's all part of the chain. If you want anything, if you want a cell phone then you need oil and gas and you need steel and you need aluminum and you need all of these things. So, it, um, so what do you want to focus on? Do we want to focus on uh, reducing our footprint? Uh, but the climate change thing, it, it just, that's just a hammer that they can wander around and, and pound anything that looks like a nail to them because everything goes right. It's like, Oh, well, children are starving in India. Well, that's because of climate change or, or their oceans rising in Miami. That's because of climate change. The ice caps are melting. It's climate change. That the the minorities are suffering more than the others. That's climate change. So they they love that. So we have to take that environmental tool out of their hands. Let's transition to natural gas a little bit. You and I have talked about this before. Natural gas is a foundation fuel, not a bridge fuel. Uh, Michael mm-hmm. Moore came out with Planet of the Humans, and I always tell people Michael Moore is not in it. It's it, he just is backing it. Some other guy, uh-huh. you know, is yeah. in it, and it's I I really. I've got some opinions on it. I'd like to know your thoughts as well. But um, the one thing that I thought that movie showed more than anything was uh, there was some biomass things. And I'm looking at your website and you've got an article on that. We'll get to that in just a second. But it's the natural gas side of really it's more of a foundation fuel for the next unforeseeable future than it is a bridge fuel. Uh, you, you're involved with a natural gas company, so you know you've got some bias, but uh, you also have some knowledge that a lot of people don't have either. So, um, as somebody who's generally impartial, talk to me about uh, natural gas, where we're at, where you see things going, and the um, tie-in. I guess how the uh, planet of the humans basically showed that you can't do anything without natural gas today. Right. Right. Um- yeah, just a, a bit on that film for a second, which I, I don't know if you've heard, but it's been yanked off of YouTube, um, and hopefully it'll make an appearance soon. But uh, somebody in there objected to their usage of about four seconds of footage, and they um, went straight to YouTube and demanded that the film be taken down. So anyways, censorship at its finest, but hopefully it'll be back up soon. Um, if you can see it, watch it. It's not perfect for sure. 
uh, Michael Moore is anti-business, anti-capitalist, and and I've, I've um, that's one side of his reporting that's never appealed to me. But I do like how he challenges preconceived notions. He, when he took on the auto sector, I thought there was a lot of merit to his arguments, and there tends to be a lot of when he takes on Wall Street, there's merits to his arguments, and when he takes on the environment or not, I did it myself, the climate change movement. Um, there's merit to his arguments too, and you're right. You can't do anything without natural gas. You can't these these a, a wind and solar system is does not work on any large scale. There are no batteries that that can replace um, the base load power of uh, natural gas or coal, even if we get away from coal. Uh, whoever came up with the term that natural gas is a foundation fuel and not a bridge fuel, I think that's brilliant because it is. It's just if you want to if you want to meet the world's uh, climate change targets. The, the, you could the quickest and easiest way to do it is to get rid of coal and replace it all with natural gas, and it's plentiful. And there's um, uh, we have we have great distribution system set up for it already, which is something that people uh, neglect to think about when they talk about a transition. Is to rebuild the world's infrastructure is is virtually impossible in a, in a day and age when it's hard to build anything because of nimbyism and protesters and there's always somebody fighting something so we already have this massive infrastructure set up for natural gas so and it, and it works it just works and it works cleanly and it's better than coal and and i think still think nuclear is a great thing too but that has a lot of opponents um on the activist side also uh so natural gas and you're right i probably do have a bias because i work in the industry but but the flip side is also as you mentioned that people that work in this industry understand it better and maybe we're proponents because we can see how important it is not just because um it's uh it's our livelihood the one thing i wish that the governments if they're going to get involved and i mean this is a this whole free market versus subsidies versus um you know controlling production thing the the part that they you know talk about is flaring and emissions are down because less drilling's going on that's great and everything but if we're going to bring it back and we're going to start bringing them on why don't they start putting some of those crazy science projects out there you know subsidizing those a little bit then if they're gonna that's the thing i mean if they're gonna start picking winners and losers i still go back to the natural gas crazy bitcoin miners and the guys who are turned it into fuel on site and all kinds of different things they can solve a lot of these problems and be a nice little bridge and fix and everything but it just seems government's doing the job that government always does which is centralizing power and they want uh-huh. all those pipelines built and it they, they'll they'll throw a dog a bone occasionally to make sure one of these crazy scientists get in the paper and get some little media exposure. But it just seems overall, the bigger picture, they're just not supporting the way that they're trying to get the centralization done. Um, I don't know if that's anything that, that you're qualified to talk about or, or notice or anything along those lines, but that's just been my observation when it comes to some of the natural gas. Well, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. I'm probably not qualified. The, the the thoughts that I have on there extend a little bit into um, the if if you want to make prog if you want to make progress on cleaning up the environment or, or whatever or reducing emissions, then um, you you there there has to be a we have to limit consumption somehow, and the way that that works best is through the price mechanism. And natural gas is one of the cheapest fuels out there right now so it makes sense that it's being adopted more and that's that's one of the natural pathways to making the world cleaner and greener is if we go to natural gas and the market is telling us that there's a lot of natural gas so we should be moving it towards it instead of fighting against it so i don't think that answers your question directly but the 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 price mechanism ultimately is the best way to do it rather than having governments trying to to force um policies which are just pushing a boulder uphill and they don't work anyways if you get too reliant on renewables you create other problems because they're they haven't been sorted out by the people that are that are operating the electrical grid for example or the distribution systems if it happens as a as a natural process then 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 we can get there 
because the market is intended to do it. Like you said, there's a lot of people with a lot of ideas, and when the when the market is ready for them, they will um, they will become a part of the, the dialogue. Well, I just look at the amount of uh, I guess ancillary that goes into a lot of the natural gas science projects. You know, you're talking about shipping containers full of computers and shipping containers full of levers and steel pipes and all kinds of different things versus, you know, what the wind turbines are and the solar panels are and the amount of mining that goes into that and the amount of materials and, you know, non-biodegradable fiberglass and all kinds of different things that I would think that the actual subsidies going towards the natural gas projects would be greener <laughs> than, than what they're trying yeah. to than what the science projects are for the solar and the wind projects that have failed over the last 40 years. That's what I'm getting yeah, at yeah. is that the, it, the body of work's been done. Right, right. And at the end of the day, even if you put all of that money into wind and solar, you're still left with intermittent power, which isn't how we live. That's not how the world works. We don't, don't yeah, and, and, things, but, and people forget that fact too. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, and it's it's it, yeah, it's just covered up, or or or, or now the um, the media onslaught is that well, don't worry, batteries are coming. Well, we've been saying that for a hundred years that there's batteries coming, and they are making they're they're making advances in batteries for sure. But in, on the scale of the power that we consume, there's there's nothing even on the horizon, battery wise, that could that could make that system work, store enough power to to cause society to function when the sun goes down and the wind quits blowing because you have to prepare for both that there there are times when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine and you need you need full capacity unless people are willing to if you can convince society to say okay when the sun goes down i will dial back my power consumption by 50 percent and if the wind and wind dies down and the sun quits blowing i'll dial it back by 90 percent if you can convince people to work that way then you got a plan but i don't see it happening Public Energy Number One is the website. Terry Edom is the guest. He's also the author of The End of the Fossil Fuel Insanity, which is available at Amazon and uh, barnesandnoble.com, places like that. I assume, was it right, barnesandnoble.com, or did I just throw that out there? It is, yeah, okay, Barnes good. and Noble, yeah. I figured you were like one of those legit authors. Uh, so uh, just kind of wrapping up a little bit, getting back to the original topic at hand, which is, really the crossroads and the nexus that the United States industry is at, which is you've got kind of an older mindset of, of free market, no subsidies, and then you've got this kind of younger CEO in states now uh, having discussions of whether there should be government-controlled oil and gas production. Yeah. And, you know, it's yeah. interesting, too. And I'll just, you know, I'll, like I said, I'd like to wrap this up because we both have lives to get to. But uh, I, I do want to just mention one thing. If my memory serves me correctly, and most times it does still, which is nice. I still like that. Um, not all the time, but most times it does. Is that before this fracking boom, this, this uh, you know, happened in what, about 2005, we'll call it? Last 15 years? Sorry, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I always bring up the 90s were low oil prices. But even if you go back to the 70s, when the last time the railroad, the Texas Railroad Commission kind of controlled production, uh, most of the private oil and gas drilling for the globe was only about 10, 12, 15 percent. So it wasn't mm -hmm. until the fracking boom that the shale boom where the privatization of the oil and gas companies took off. So I think that's an interesting dynamic in this, too, that, you know, we're dealing with a couple generations that aren't used to having government intervention to the tune to where private oil and gas companies were only 10 percent of the marketplace in the globe. So uh, I don't know if you're, yeah. you're you remember that or if, or if I'm out of line. Well, I know my numbers are loose, but. No, no, that and that's fine. It's the concept that matters. And it's actually a very interesting uh, angle and, and something that, that should have been mentioned earlier, and, and uh, I'm glad you brought it up. So Canada went through the similar sort of thing when the oil when the oil sands the price of oil first took off around 2000. It went from twenty dollars a barrel up to a steady climb up to hundred and some dollars a barrel, and that, that had never happened before, which which caused new plays to develop or new um, uh, areas to be developed. Like the oil sands, everyone's known that they were there for 
hundreds of years, and and all of a sudden they were economic, and it was an absolute boom. Where anybody, there were people going up there getting jobs driving trucks and making one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year, and you couldn't find housing. And and this will sound familiar for the Permian people. Um, it was just such an absolute boom that that um, if you walk down the street, you get ten job offers, and and that that's that's an unnatural state of affairs too, caused by a, a, a rapid, historically speaking, uh, dislocation of prices, which makes something economic. And then the same thing happened in the shale boom in the U.S. The new technology and the price of oil all of a sudden just changed everything. So historically, that's it's important to keep that in context too. That these are such um, rapid and outsized increases in um, in production that it's just totally destabilizing for everything. You're you're we ne- you never had to deal with it on that order of magnitude before when in like if the, the I've heard lots of stories out of Texas and New Mexico about what the conditions there, like the 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 worker influx and the, the amount of money being made and and the um, uh, just the, mon- the amount of money being thrown around to get this developed and it's it's these boom times. Other industries I don't think see them quite like the oil patch does, especially because they're up and down. It goes up that quick and it goes down that quick. And and we'll, <clears throat> we haven't had one of this magnitude, <clears throat> excuse me, in a long time. But there's. There's a reason that the the oil patch is famous for booms and busts. Is this is kind of how it goes? This one was just um, far bigger than anything we've seen before. So I think people have to keep that in context too. That we're it's a, it's sort of a new era in terms of um, this this uh, size of growth. Like I mean, to turn the oil to turn the United States from a net oil importer to an oil exporter over the span of a decade is just like unheard of in the world, right? For a country the size of the United States. So that's very dislocating in itself. So if people are having trouble trying to make sense of where the government should fit in all of this, that's understandable because it's it's just such a, a strange um, phenomenon. I will mention this too, is that I, I'm a big fan of the free market. I'm a big fan of small business because I love creativity. I love quick and nimble. I also understand the role of corporations. I also understand that. So I, I understand the big, slow boulder moving down the you know the down the whole, down the hill type mm-hmm. of a thing but at the same time i also understand and appreciate the small business and i'm looking at public energy number com. that's your website hey shell not so fast come back for a chat that's <laughs> that's your that's your title of your your blog entry that you have oh, and, and and i wanted to tie that in with a comment vicky steiner mentioned to me when she went up to alaska to spoke uh, speak at the legislative body which was up in alaska it's like state-owned oil so they only have basically two companies shell and bp and to get mm-hmm. anything done it takes years sometimes north dakota you can get it done in like three days. You know what I mean? So uh, that, that's well, that, that's yeah. the different dynamic of things. Well, and maybe I'm being 30 days, we'll call it, whatever it is. But yeah, yeah. You, you understand my deal. You're talking about, hey, Shell, yeah. come back so fast. It made me remind uh, reminded me of that to where when you're dealing with uh, government control, it just slows things down quite a bit. So it's kind of a transition for you to comment on that and then also – Go into your blog if you wouldn't mind. Oh sure. Well, and, and that's a yeah. I, I wrote about this in my book too. That's a challenge for everyone to understand is that uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago, um, the big oil ruled the world. Kind of. There's always been an active junior market, of course, and smaller industries. But with the big petroleum world was controlled by state oil companies, like you said, and then the the big um, big oil, which were, which developed a lot of those concessions on behalf of those countries. So they have their own way of working, and it's slow, and it's bureaucratic, and it's it's multi-decade the way that they look at things. And then and then running around on the ground are all of these smaller guys who who are innovative and they get things done. And then they historically have always just been bought up in in ever bigger like a big um, a food chain where they ultimately wind up in the big companies anyway. So so it's the 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 innovative sector which keeps things it's smaller sector which keeps things growing in in my opinion rather than the the, the big oil guys who are more bureaucratic, they do have their own breakthroughs, of course, but the dynamism of small business is what really keeps things humming. The the blog that I wrote there was about Shell. Shell is kind of, um, and I, I have a lot of respect for Shell 
in general, but they seem like they've been worried more about their image than the substance of what they're doing lately. And they're, um, they, they make a lot of noise in their, in their PR material about how green they are and how they're going to renewable and how ESG environmental, social and governance issues are their, their priority. And, um, they, they sold off all of their oil sands because, um, just because they didn't like being associated with it, even though it was perfectly integrated with their, their, their shell is very good at doing an integrated business model where they, they have the, the, they develop the production, they, they develop a marketing mechanism for it, including transportation. They refine it and they sell it through their own retail chains around the world. And they, they, they brag about that in their, in their material, in their annual report. They're saying how critical it is to have an integrated project from one end to the other. And then in Canada, they sold off the production arm. And so I was just kind of challenging them on that, saying, well, if it's so important, why did you do that? Sell off just the oil sands. And the, the answer is because it's just for reputational purposes only. But at the same time, they sold off their oil sands for something like $12 billion Canadian. They turned around and they dumped all that money into Nigeria. So how does that help the world? And they still produce more than, more than half their production is still oil. But you don't, you don't get that out of their PR materials. So in, in that that was I was challenging them there on on like c- could you be a little bit more consistent or, or or instead of just pandering to that are you doing any good by pandering to that crowd when you're still producing as much oil as anybody else except the only difference is you're going to parts of the world where nobody looks you go to you invest in Russia you invest in uh, offshore deep water and you, you invest in Nigeria and these places where where there's no scrutiny. And, and, and do you think that's good? Is that is that admirable behavior? Is that helping anything? Um, and, and then they, they did something in Canada where they, they took a, a field that had a bunch of potential liabilities as an old sour gas field, and they sold it off to a, a very small company, um, a very capable small company, but small companies are having a very tough go of it these days. And the regulator in Alberta said, not so fast, we're not going to let you sell that to a small company because there's a risk that they could go under as has been happening in Canada. And then the uh, province will get left with the abandonment liabilities. And, and so the regulator in the province here blocked the sale. And so I was just calling, calling that up there too and saying, why are you doing this? And um, is this sort of a, the best practices that you want to show the world when you shine some light on it? Is this what you really, you, you, you're acting green, but are you really being green? So that was, I was just challenging Shell a little bit there. And incidentally, I heard back from two people that worked at Shell, or one that does work at Shell, and one that retired from Shell, and they both said they loved the article. So I was a bit surprised at that. But <laughs> well, sometimes people like when you get to pre- present a different point of view. You know, that's one of the reasons why we like to have our international energy expert and author and blogger and writer. You still doing the BOE report too? I do. Yep, yep. Try and keep busy. Yep. Well, he's an author of. End of the Fossil Fuel Insanity, writer for the BOE Report and blogger for Public Energy Number 1, and he also has a day job in the natural gas world, so one of the busiest guys in energy that we know. So uh, where where can people uh, find you these days as far as a plug for you? Sure. Um, my website is, uh, yeah, Public Energy Number 1, and uh, on the BOE Report, the Canadian Energy uh, site that has a pretty good commentary about everything that's happening on the on the Canadian scene and also international is covered too and my, my blogs are there regularly so yeah uh, look forward to more readers and send me an email at my emails at the end of every BOE report post that I do it's on my website you can get a hold of me and um, it's uh, if you, you know, there's a contact at the back of my book too so maybe buy the book is the best way to get my email address there's a plug <laughs> 